My name is Jeff Day. I'm the director of the architecture program at, at UNL, and um, pleased to have you here for the, the final lecture in the fall semester of the Hyde Lecture Series, uh, where we're asking uh, a series of speakers to answer the question, what's next for the, their particular discipline, architecture, interior design, landscape architecture, planning, uh, what have you. Uh, and tonight, I'm really excited to have Jimenez Lai join us. Uh, Jimenez is a faculty member at UCLA and leader of Bureau Spectacular, uh, his, his design practice based in Los Angeles. Previously, Jimenez Lai lived and worked in a desert shelter at Taliesin and resided in a shipping container. Uh, my students should uh, pay attention to that. Um, at, at, at Telia Van Lieshoopt in, uh, on the piers in Rotterdam. Before founding Bureau Spectacular, Lai worked at various international offices, including some time at OMA. And then he is widely exhibited, much of his work does involve exhibition, um, and published around the world, including uh, the MoMA collected White Elephant. And then his first manifesto, as, which I have right here, Citizens of No Place, uh, was published by Princeton Architectural Press with a grant from the Graham Foundation. And he's won numerous awards, including the Architecture League of New York's Prize for Young Architects, the debut prize or debut award uh, at the Lisbon Triennale. In, uh, and in um, 2014, Lai designed uh, and fabricated the Taiwan Pavilion at the 14th Venice Architectural Biennale, obviously in Venice. Um, in, in 2015, uh, not too long ago, he organized the, the Treatise Exhibition and Publication Series at the Graham Foundation in, in Chicago. Um, his practice, Bureau Spectacular, imagines other worlds and engages the design of architecture through telling the telling of stories, stories that conflate design, representation, theory, criticism, history, and taste into cartoon pages. And these cartoon narratives serve, swerve into the physical world through architectural installations, models, and small buildings. And then the trajectory from Citizens of No Place to the current work, which you'll see tonight, uh, has been a movement away from the linear narratives of the book, a book which involves one page after another, um, to the sort of nonlinear and disconnected narratives that define inhabited architectural space where adjacencies may or may not generate new kinds of stories. And this shift has also been one towards a more speculative and pro projective form of practice uh, and an implicit critique based uh, within that work. And like George Perec's novel, Life, a User's Manual, um, which is a, 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 a series of interlapping stories about a building in Paris, a fictional building, Lai's work demonstrates how architecture is composed of and defined by the overlapping stories of its subjects. I'm sure you will find these and other stories in the following talk very interesting. So please welcome Jimenez Lai. Jeff, thank you for the introdu introduction and the invita invitation. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, the, in the introduction image, you'll see, um, I was saying earlier, uh, I've always wondered what would happen if you gave Jackson Pollock a Frank Stella canvas. No? OK. <laughs> Moving on. So um, I, uh, this talk will be divided into five parts. I'll, I'll, I'm going to power through them as quickly as possible, so strap in. Uh, we'll, 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 we'll try to get through it as quickly as possible. Uh, so the five parts are going to be first here, uh, friends and you. Uh, next I will talk about scattered objects. Uh, after that I'll talk about the powerful furniture. Um, it will be followed by gravity, bodies and faces. And finally, normal. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, between gravity and faces there's also another segment called bricks and balloons. So, uh, as Jeff mentioned, um, I published this book, Citizens of No Place. It is a comic book, um, and you know, within the comic book, uh, and also as, as he mentioned, it's a se sequ series of sequenced pages uh, that make up stories. Uh, in other words, it's a linear storyline. It is as though the uh, pages are skewered by time, and you, you could flip leaf through it. Uh, but I've also been taking on, I guess, um, practices that, that um, 
uh, demand drawings to be single page drawings or single image drawings. Uh, so the narrative would be implicit within itself, the drawing itself, rather than uh, several pages. Uh, in addition to drawing and publishing, uh, I, I've, I'm also, I also uh, know that as, as, since I did sign up, to, sign up to do architecture, one must build. Uh, and in terms of furniture, we do do it. And in terms of very large furniture, we also do have, have been doing that. And we're maybe uh, zeroing, on, on, zeroing in on small buildings at the moment. Um, so aside from, I guess, publishing, drawing, building, uh, teaching, uh, I, there's also an, a component of curating uh, there, that happens in the work, uh, a Bureau Spectacular sometimes. Um, and, you know, Treatise was a really uh, important moment in, in I guess, uh, my, my life, uh, where I had the opportunity to collaborate with Grand Foundation to select 14 practices uh, in the world uh, today. And within the 14 practices, you know, we were looking at pa uh, pamphlet architecture as a tradition to follow. Pamphlet architecture, uh, started by student Stephen Hall, was a platform for young architects to explore their thoughts through writing and drawing. And we felt that it would be a, a good thing to do to maybe introduce all 14 of people who were born somewhere between 1974 to 1984, uh, all in one go. Uh, you know, following the Netflix um, type of public publishing methods. Uh, one of the one of one of the mem one of the members of uh, this group of fourteen would be here. Uh, D Design with Company will be here, I guess, next semester, which is really wonderful. But one might ask, why go through the trouble of curating? Why, why does it matter if you know if all you're really doing is designing architecture, we're thinking about architecture, we're writing about architecture. Uh, a friend of mine once told me, which I, I still carry with me, it's never who you are, but who you're with. And I think he's right. Uh, it's never who you are, but who you're with. Who, uh, who, I'm, who I choose to surround myself around eventually define me, because not only do they influence me, I'm, I probably gravitate towards them for qualities that I wish I had. And I, I would say that's very much true in, in, this, in this list of people that I uh, went, went out and met. And in this list of people, for example, this is Design with Company, they'll, they'll be here uh, next quarter. So for example, you might, one, for example, you know, some of the qualities that one would be looking at, I would, I would be thinking, is it possible to be thinking about cinematic environments and the construction of uh, storyboards uh, in terms of how we think about sequences of rooms? Is it possible to, so here I'm doing the left-right uh, art history style juxtaposition where uh, the person on your left is someone that I, uh, who would be a friend or that I think about, and I'm comparing um, the, this person's work with uh, a similar train of thought. Is it possible to maybe engage uh, nihilism with a sense of, uh, let's say, with a nice dose of optimism, uh, maybe in, in an Albert Camus sense of the word, um, to create a kind of absurd realities uh, from architectural drawings. Um, could it be that we can look at somebody, some people who have a really good understanding of the this difference between size and scale, since size and scale are slightly different things, and as they get, become introduced, so this is Andrew Kovacs and Klaus Oldenburg, uh, as, they, as the objects that they choose with, uh, you know, get blown up into the world, uh, could, could we then relook at the world differently, knowing that there are a lot of objects with architectural qualities that are all around us? Um, you know, some of the qualities that I look for in, in maybe these friends that I encountered, may, maybe some people just don't know how to draw very well. Uh, they incorrectly uh, place their vanishing points. And also, uh, you know, for example, Giotto, in, in the case of the, the medieval city over there, is totally incorrectly scaled. It's almost as though a cluster of bunched up facades are um, as tall as the person who's ne next to it. Um, and I think this kind of verbatim reading of the correct versus incorrect drawings is something that someone like Thomas Kelly really ma mastered very well. And um, are there people that we could think about who are, who are becoming masters of uh, digital techniques 
who, who know how to man, uh, manage doubly curved surfaces that would get bunched up next to each other, much the same way that Baroque babies and angels would have bunched up surfaces like cheeks of face and che butt cheeks that are uh, 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 adjacent to one another. Uh, uh, could there be people who are just Pos uh, who, who just possess this ability to see beauty in everything in the world, and everything uh, can be retold in a, in a beautiful way? Or are there people who do nothing, uh, from people who do everything to do people who do nothing? Uh, I, I find that it's interesting to uh, think of people who edit uh, out information, and there are people who edit it out by erasing it, and others edit things out by, by focusing on what's only photogenic. Or perhaps, I mean, I realized that Florian was just here. Perhaps there are people that I am gravitated towards uh, simply because the form of expression is architect architecture itself. Uh, it's not the representation, not the drawing, not the rhetoric, uh, but the art is in the architecture. So by surrounding myself, I guess uh, we're, we're expressing, or identifying people that I gravitate towards. I feel like it's a healthy process to also uh, imagine, let's say, what's next in one's own future or one's own career. And uh, by maybe looking back at people who had a lifetime, who, who's had you know, work that I admire, I then began, began to ask, is it simply enough to be visionary, uh, or to apply the word visionary to architecture? And, and I think I want to maybe highlight this case. Um, the drawing to your left, Micromegas, is one of the most astoundingly beautiful work uh, of architectural drawing, I think, that's, we, we, I would say, that's ever been performed, ever. Uh, uh, maybe on, in the same way that we think of, you know, um, the continuous monument or No Stop City as being visionary, Micromegas itself as well. But uh, later in uh, Mr. Liebskin's career, I think, uh, in terms of the consensus of the people that I'm around, we would say there, there's been the case of uh, one project, two careers. But strangely, uh, that's uh, a little different, but, but kind of similar in the case of Frank Gehry, there's been at least five careers and one project. Uh, so I'm, I'm maybe highlighting this case in terms of thinking about um, as I'm embarking on the building side of my career, I'm, think, I'm maybe also anticipating uh, these, these kinds of roadblocks where uh, possible dangers were landmines that may blow up. Uh, but, but, you know, looking at all five of these photographs, and I'm not even showing the uh, Bilbao project or the, the Disney Concert Hall, uh, we know that there are many Frank Gehrys, much the same way that we know that there are many Picassos, where there are many Philip Johnsons. Uh, and in fact, this is the, the beginning of Frank Gehry. He was designing uh, shopping malls. Uh, and I guess what I, in this first chapter, friends and you, what I'm trying to say is uh, the, ch the friends that you choose allow you maybe the freedom, the friends that you choose maybe allow you the freedom uh, to start over again and again within your own lifetime. And maybe it's okay to not have one project, or maybe it's okay to have many careers, but one project. Um, and as I re recently have arrived in Los Angeles, I often think about this photograph and think about the new friends that I'm going to have and maybe the new things I will do, uh, which makes me excited. Okay, part two, scattered objects. As uh, Jeff mentioned, I used to work for this artist, uh, Joop van Lieselt. Uh, he's a very strange guy. I, I first came to know Joop from a lecture uh, he gave a lecture and he was talking about his art project where uh, there is a pier uh, in, near the port of Rotterdam, well, basically on the port of Rotterdam, uh, that he, he owns. Uh, and he one day, I guess, decided to declare independence to the Dutch government. Uh, the Kingdom of Netherlands obviously ignored it. Uh, they could have easily charged him with treason, but um, they recognized that this was an art project, so he was okay. Uh, but he does say, artists around the world unite, let's join this commune and uh, enter this kind of free state uh, called AVLville. And uh, I was very young at the time and, and therefore super susceptible to these kinds of requests. Uh, so I applied and went and joined the commune. 
and the, so the, the first project that I worked on was the rectum bar. Um, is a fully functioning bar uh, mobile. And you, it was really important to you that we, we made it as uh, accurate as possible anatomically. It's a really gross person. Um, but but the, here's AVLville, and also because I, since I arrived illegally um, to, into this kind of commune or independent free state, uh, I, I couldn't really rent an apartment um, since I was just a tourist. And, and, but, you know, the AVL guys were saying, there's no problem, you could stay in one, one of these shipping containers that we've modified. And so this, this was the one that I slept in. Uh, it was really kind of, I guess, nice in the evenings to see, to watch, you know, cargoes go by. Um, or cruises sometimes. Um, and I also, during this time, I, I had no, not very, I guess I really had no personal possession. I had, had maybe one suitcase, and, uh, and over, over the months that I stayed here, I lost about maybe 10 kilograms. Uh, but I, when I came back to, I guess when I, uh, when Bob Somo hired me in Chicago, I, I finally had the opportunity to, uh, you know, start having some possessions. And the first thing that I did was maybe t remembering a piece of Rotterdam and, and kind of somehow brought it back to ch Chicago. So I rented the space, uh, which was, uh, to me, it was really inexpensive, roughly 1,400 square feet for about $1,000. Uh, per month. So I rented it and I decided that I'll build a house inside of this house or build a box inside of the box. Uh, and the name of, of this project was the brief, Briefcase House. Uh, and I began living inside of the brief, Briefcase House uh, upon completion of the project. Uh, you can see that here was the beginning of Bureau Spectacular, uh, some desks, and I lived here. And there was a bookshelf. It, it was also, um, it's a simple plywood b balloon frame uh, studs uh, kind of construction with uh, casters. So uh, there was, there's, there's the function of the guest bedroom upstairs. Uh, there a kind of bleacher that I could invite friends over and project movies. Um, obviously a bookshelf and some storage and a mattress was is behind it. Uh, and so it also really helped cut down the commute time for me. To work. When I completed this project, I asked myself, is this architecture? Uh, you know, and I said, no, it's not architecture. Uh, it's too small to be architecture, uh, but at the same time, it's too big to be furniture. So the, the, train of thought, and the train of thought began. I started developing this idea that this is, let's call this super furniture. It's too big to be furniture, too small to be architecture. Uh, so, super furniture, uh, is this an original thought? I would say no, because when I, when I thought about uh, the interior of the Farnsworth house by Mies van der Rohe, I remember this box inside the box. This box inside the box contained several functions, including kitchen, bathroom, fireplace, storage, and so on and so forth. But that's not all that's interesting about this box. What's also interesting about this box is the fact that four programs were created by its obstructive presence. Uh, by, the, by the sheer fact of it sitting in the middle, uh, ideas of the bedroom or the kitchen or the living room uh, began to emerge around the, uh, the core without ever erecting one single partition wall, which I thought was a really interesting way of thinking about negative space or positive, sp positive space, where the idea of painting something black uh, if this is a core and not occupiable, is that black and is this white? It was simultaneously around a time in my life that was very turbulent. I was going through a uh, separation. And so I was, you know, maybe going through very dark thoughts. For example, uh, if I'm inside the object, I'm private. And therefore, in the Noli sense, Noli, Noli map sense of the word, I could paint my life black. I could paint my box black. Or if I'm inside of it, the rest of the world might as well be black. I could paint everything else black. Uh, of course, I know that's really dark uh, as, as a train of thought, but it also afforded other ways of thinking about the wall detail. And now the wall detail, so, suddenly my wall was so thick uh, that my wall detail could be blown up and programmed. And as I mentioned, uh, you know, it's really a, a super bachelor pad, I guess. Um, it could be shut off. Um, 
So the briefcase house uh, as, as a super furniture uh, allowed me to consider uh, the idea of scale of architecture a little further. Um, as a Taiwanese born, born person, I, I realized that um, I had the rights to apply for the pavilion at the Venice Biennale. Um, you know, anyone who's a passport holder is allowed to apply. So I, I applied um, and luckily, you know, eventually we got it. Um, and the context of this pavilion, since Taiwan is not officially recognized by Italy as a country, we had to be offsite. And we were placed inside of the Palazzo della Prigioni, which is next to the Bridge of Sighs, next to San Sorvino's Doge's Palace. Um, and eventually this is what we did. And the name of this project is Township of Domestic Parts. Uh, we were very fortunate to have been able to work with uh, Natasha Jen from Pentagram. And a graphic designer, super excellent graphic des designers. Um, and we were able to work with Iwan Ban uh, for, for these photographs. So what is it? Uh, what, what's this township of domestic parts? I guess for, for me, uh, I was thinking about the uh, like content of a house. If a, content, if a house itself is somewhat of an animal, um, it's, it's, it has several guts and it has you know, many parts that you can cut apart. Uh, you know, components such as bedroom, living room, dining room are separable. And so we, we decided to take that really far and, and, and proclaim that each program should be its own house. So, for example, the house of sleep, house of social dining, house of study, and so on and so forth. And we also wanted to apply a kind of character or qual architecture, uh, yeah, character quality to where the kind of personality to the uh, freestanding single um, program houses. So the nine single program houses, as, as you scatter them onto the interior, uh, what to me what began to happen was this kind of um, loose fit plan where, where kind of urbanism, interior urbanism, so to speak. Because if I'm interested in comics, which I am, um, you know, I would be always negotiating between the ideas of the bubble versus the gutter. In the industry, they call the gap between the, the, the bubbles, gutters, and I guess in the industry of architecture, we would call them corridors. But in this case, since a lot of them are open, you, could, you have the option of walking between them or walking through them, uh, which allowed us to think of um, in interior urban, urbanism as both permeable and also episodic in its pro program nature. And so as we developed the plan, uh, it was kind of an exciting moment to be thinking about a plan as comic book work, architectural plan as um, uh, distinct f bubbles or clouds. Maybe not, not in so much of a dissimilar way that we've always viewed um, the Moriyama house from Sana as a comic book. Um, if, so here's one of the pages of comics that I drew, but if I tipped it on the side, uh, I could see ideas of the Gut, uh, gutters or gaps or uh, ideas of superimpositions of foregrounds, midgrounds, and backgrounds. And maybe it's also remaining on the same train of thought as Stan Allen's Korean American Museum, where if you scatter enough objects inside of a room, and if the objects themselves are not parallel with each other, you begin to create a lot of corners, and not just corners, but corners with compressive and expansive qualities, uh, which I think is really urban. Maybe in addition to that, uh, of course, we would be thinking about Polly Effelbaum uh, in her art project, In No Way, Shape, or Form, where she would scatter uh, interestingly sh shaped um, f precious fabric uh, inside of a room. And as people who would be interested in art and understand the object hood of art when they, upon the moment they're placed inside of galleries, you know that we're not supposed to touch them, let alone step on them. So since you cannot step on art, uh, you know, you would maybe walk around art. You would then suddenly respect these kinds of uh, pinches and also enjoy these moments of uh, expansions, uh, which I think is really spatial in, in a lot of ways. So for us, I think we, we, with these things in mind, we were very happy to be working with gaps. We were very happy to, work with, to be working with uh, you know, episodes with identity, episodes with character, or episodes with personality. In short, uh, in, in terms of the th thought process on 
uh, scattered objects. Uh, for us, the loose fit plan is something uh, about the inside versus outside of architecture. Uh, architecture to us, it's soft on the inside, hard on the outside. Okay, next, we're gonna talk about the power of furniture. Um, Oscar Niemeyer's Des Canoa's house is one of my favorite plans uh, that's, that I know of, uh, that, that I've ever seen, I've ever studied. Uh, I find this plan to be extremely pleasant uh, to look at. It's really hard for me to talk about this plan without saying nice curves. Uh, of course, I would say nice curves, but then as a rational person, I would also uh, be suddenly conflicted with this uh, sense, how do, what do you mean by nice curves? How do you qualify nice curves? I guess, but then with, without thinking about all that, uh, what's also really interesting about this plan, like many plans that we know of, is that we can identify action by uh, the positioning of furniture. Furniture is extremely powerful. In fact, when I see a chair, uh, I see an invitation. I see, I guess, maybe somewhere between 18 to 20 inches uh, of flat surface that is demanding me to sit down. When I see a mattress inside of a room, I feel that there are certain local bylaws I, I shouldn't violate. So for example, I really, I really shouldn't eat on this surface where I in, where, where by in that room at large. And if I eat in that room, it's probably a luxury. And I know that I'm breaking some rules. Or uh, if I see a, a kitchen sink counter, I definitely shouldn't be sleeping there. If I sleep there, uh, it's a total, uh, let's say, uh, breach of trust between me and the house. And so th these kinds of social orders that we impose upon ourselves creates, I guess, uh, you know, pr ideas of correct beh proper behaviors and in incorrect behaviors. Uh, but then all the indicator or the signal really all mostly come from furniture. In terms of thinking about plans and the positioning of furniture, I have to maybe revisit the article written by Rem Kohlhaas, Typical Plan. And in this article, a, a kind of celebration is being made about the repeatable, flexible, open surfaces uh, that stack up to become a tower, which is maybe the symbol of American capitalism. And a kind of capitalism that requires flexibility. In fact, it is important that you can scatter your furniture any way you want. In contrast, when we think about Philip Johnson's glass house, if I so far as move one of the tables by a few inches, I would say it's no longer the, the glass house. The plan is no longer the glass house because the exactness of the positioning of the furniture pieces for Philip Johnson in this house is a, f a fixed choreography. It cannot be moved. So we, we have the case of hyperflexibility and total, I guess, specificity. So you have an environment of specific architecture versus a flexible architecture. And the, the definition or the differences are defined by furniture. Uh, this is maybe even taken a little further in, the, in Hitoshi Abe's office urbanism, where a kind of dense environment on the interior is defined by the gaps between furniture and furniture alone. Uh, our entry, this is our entry for the 2015 Chicago Biennial uh, titled Furniture Urbanism, where we want to revisit this, revisit this question of flexibility versus specificity. If, we, if uh, the pieces them, in themselves are removable, repositionable, but then they all have to fit within this uh, pretty tight t uh, 12 by 24 footprint. In other words, we're, cr we're, we're um, predicting a, t a definite case of congestion. There is no way that we can escape congestion. But what happens when you have congestion? It mean, and because it, it also means that a conflicting program will be adjacent to one another. If I place something like a trash chute right next to something that would be resemble a recliner really close to a doghouse and right next to a kiddie pool, I'm receiving a lot of mixed signals as to what I should be doing as a, as a well, uh, I guess, a, a law-abiding citizen of the domestic environment. And so for, for us, thinking about this uh, world of congestion uh, is maybe one way of saying, re, uh, uh, declaring a rejection to both specificity and flexibility. A, re, a rejection by constructing a jungle of furniture, 
a jungle of furniture that, that, that has so many prompts of actions that are expected. And there, a jungle of furniture that has, uh, I guess, a mixed uh, bag of dimensions and curve types. And I, th I would say the beginning of this thought process came from a drawing like this in Sad Outside Between Beyond, which uh, I took on back in 2014. The furniture, or the power of furniture, I think it's something that, that's within, uh, I guess, the thought process of, of, our, of our practice at Bureau Spectacular. And this is a different project that we, we collaborated with an artist, uh, Grayson Cox, uh, to develop this project. Uh, we were commissioned by a storefront for art and architecture um, in New York to d design uh, a really, really big furniture for the occasion of the 20, for the occasion of the 30th anniversary of, store, of Storefront for our architecture. Uh, we took the footprint of Storefront, which is a trapezoid, as you can see, uh, extruded it, uh, and I guess exploded it into ergonomically shaped clouds. And as you exploded it, I guess uh, action could be performed on the clouds. Uh, we later cladded the pieces uh, so that it's you know easier to index the position since the uh, uh, top surface is a rainbow. Uh, it was all fabricated by this gentleman, uh, Reeves Rash, who's located in northern Kentucky. Uh, he, he owns a, I guess his, his wife's family owns a farm, and so he put state-of-the-art equipment inside of this uh, barn uh, in some, somewhere super remote. And uh, he, he would, I guess, I guess get, get clients like me, uh, we, we would hire him to do some uh, difficult uh, projects and he would do it. I, I highly recommend him. He's really great. If you guys are in the business of hiring, you know, a, a, a fabricator. So, uh, the, these objects were, were milled out of foam, uh, cladded with neoprene. We printed this rainbow gradient onto the neoprene and um, I guess capped it with this uh, heat sensitive tape that you can iron onto. Uh, and so the the nine night chair super furniture, well not super furniture, but normal ish furniture, uh, is a three D jigsaw puzzle that explodes into the clouds, as you can see. It was a really nice moment to see all four of the former directors of Storefront sitting together. Here's Kiln Park, the founder, Sarah Herda, Joseph Grimma, and Eva Frank, the current director, uh, and they were having a nice chat about shovels. It's a really good story, uh, maybe for another time. Okay, next, um, gravity. Um, back in 2008, uh, the first built work that I made was uh, titled Fallon Street Module. It was, uh, it was constructed inside of a, a courtyard of, of a, I guess, a gallery called Materials and Applications. This was a competition that we won. Um, we, the prompt of it for the competition was gravity defiance. For us, I guess graffiti is a really interesting prompt, and we thought our angle into this question, gravity defiance, would be on the status of orthogra orthographic projections. If plan and section and reflect ceiling plan are all flat and orthographic, the only distinction between them is their relationship with the ground. Uh, we, we should be able to produce a room that, that, I guess, confuses the, or the, the, the status or the identity of the four drawings as they rotate. In other words, plan becomes sections, becomes reflective ceiling plans, and uh, we, we thought that this was a really, really interesting um, way of thinking about drawing and also thinking about ergonomics. We, it, it was at a time when, I guess, um, Freshly out, out of uh, living in Taliesin, when I was uh, thinking about spaceships a lot, um, you know, I was living in Taliesin, um, and, you know, in Taliesin West, there, there were these desert shelters with no electricity or water. Uh, and so at night, all you could really do is drink a lot of vodka and make fire. And, and one of those nights, I think we were uh, shouting about uh, urban sprawl or something. And as some, you know, bunch of well-natured people, uh, you would say, yeah, urban sprawl is super evil and really bad, and we can blame the Broad Acres city for it. It's all Frank Lloyd Wright's fault. So uh, the following day, I decided to make this model where uh, I would, I guess, encase the Broad Acres city into a rectangle and shoot it off into space. Um, but 
you know, all jokes aside, I really decided to explore the interior. And it was also at a time when I was reading uh, people like Charles Fourier, who, who was writing um, uh, text on the phalanstery, which is really in itself uh, a city inside of one architecture. And there's even a very specific social structure and, you know, um, demographic distribution uh, inside of this text. And so, but for me, I, I guess, you know, once I delve into the interior of the city, uh, it became clear that plan, elevation, uh, reflect the ceiling plan were equal, but the function of section or function of elevation versus the function of plan also became um, more and more clear to me, where plan is the objective kind of strategy where you can map your future, um, but elevation is a visual language. You would read something and produce, uh, I guess, an impression. Um, so, since we were maybe dealing with the rotation on four surfaces, uh, the principal geometry that, uh, that uh, this resulted was a cylinder uh, as we rotated it along a spine. But in Kentucky, we, we met an interesting um, gallery owner named Jura Parrish, who um, ma made a proposition to us, and we, we, we counter-propositioned to him about make, making an installation in his gallery. Uh, we wanted to maybe continue the idea of rotation and gravity into, onto a different geometry, moving on from the cylinder into the sphere. And so we wanted to know what would happen if we rotated and tumbled an object, and what are some of the architectural teachable lessons that we could learn uh, from doing a project like this. And so, um, by thinking about maybe uh, a, a, an abstraction of the sphere into a dual tetrahedron and truncating the endpoints, uh, we eventually wound up with uh, something like this, uh, which is uh, the aforementioned White Elephant Project. Uh, it was collected by the Museum of Modern Art. Uh, so there are really ba three basic principles to this project. Number one, it must rotate like a sphere. Uh, so as you can see, uh, it's basically a, s a project of tripods. There's several tripods that would uh, produce, I guess, the uh, principal surfaces of the dual tetrahedron, and you can tumble it around. Number two, it's an object that is hard on the outside, soft on the inside, uh, in every sense of the word. I guess you know, hard geometries, hard materiality. Uh, this project was built with aluminum, aluminum framing, um, po uh, polycarbonate surfaces that are sandblasted on the inside, so it stayed glossy on the outside. Uh, we molded uh, the, the hoofs, we've been calling them the hoofs, uh, from, uh, from CNC machine, and then we poured rubber uh, into, the, into, the, into the mold. Uh, on the inside, the materiality, as you can see, is cowhide, but um, these are triangular pillows that we designed uh, to fit, I guess, uh, to hook onto the, to, to the hooves. And uh, the sandwiching of the pillows are uh, fronted by the cowhide, but the backside is this parachute material called Sambrella, and we filled it with polyfill and sewed it. Uh, we hired someone to sew the surfaces, and so uh, we, we had sewn um, zippers along the edge. And so really, uh, you know, sweep along edge type of operation, we, we were able to close it. So, so that's the, the two basic principles, and, I, and the, the third basic principle was that it should be an object that is too big to be furniture and too small, too small to be architecture. So uh, it must rotate freely, it's hard on the outside, soft on the inside, and, and it's, it's a super furniture. But why must it rotate? And what is the teachable moment? What did we learn from rotating it? And I, if the previous project of the rotation taught us about surfaces and the function of surfaces on the inside, plan, section, elevation, and so forth, what we learned here is mass or the personality of mass, or maybe the personality of proportions and postures. And I'll use this story to briefly talk about, um, I guess, personalities and proportions and postures. So here you see a man who's stalking a deer, and he thinks about it, jumps over to the deer, and hugs it and slices its throat open. He kills the deer, but he doesn't take the flesh. He simply skins the deer very, very systematically and very enthusiastically. He then sews the skins back together into a cloak or a carpet. Uh, he clads himself, he covers himself under this cloak or a carpet. Uh, and by, by this act of covering himself, he created the first architectural detail. He then runs over to the woman that he loves and try to explain to her. Uh, and he covered himself. 
he covered the details of his personality to cre create this abstract person uh, who's devoid of direct emotion. But, and, but then the communication of his emotion uh, became a series of skyline. His body became a series of skyline. So does this have anything to do with architecture, you might ask? I would say yes. Uh, for as long as we can remember, we've been studying the posture of human bodies. Um, to your far left, we have the Greek kurils, circa 500 BC. In the middle, we have Michelangelo's David. And on your far right, uh, we have Bernini's David. Here we have a bilaterally stiff and I guess equal, equal proportioned, uh, symmetrical, stiff-faced, polite uh, personality uh, that seems cordial and stiff. And, and here we have what's what we, what we call contrapostal in, in our history. And you know, that's creating a kind of hip line and shoulder line that is relaxed. So you, you see a relaxed person. And for Bernini's David, uh, this David is midway through a torque. Uh, and so we have, I guess, three very different personalities. Even if we don't see their faces, we can maybe understand a kind of, kind of body language uh, to a stiff person, a relaxed person, and an intense person. And again, does this have anything to do with architecture? I would say absolutely, for sure. Um, in, the, in the 1927 Tr Tr Chicago Tribune uh, competition, Adolf Loos uh, submitted this entry, which I would say, we, when we think back to the way that Louis Sullivan was talking about the Chicago skyscrapers, which were a tripartite distribution of the podium next uh, above it would be the repeatable uh, typical plans and a crown. Much the same way that we've always talked about columns, uh, a base, a shaft, and a capital. And even the, al the, dist the, the, the allocation of the parts are resembling human bodies. In fact, we call it capital, like the head. And so, is it possible that I have always found the massing of the Seattle Public Library to be super relaxing, partially because it's performing contrapostal? Does this have, I mean, you, you might continue to ask, does this, so, who cares if massing has personality? I would say it absolutely matters to the identity of a city, uh, to the same way that we would think about, let's say, if a skyline is a sentence constructed by architecture as the individual characters to the sentence, it's not so much what you're saying, it becomes a matter of how you're saying it. So if a contrapostal massing is saying something uh, through its serifness or sans serifness or uprightness or crookedness, we are saying city time and again, but it becomes a graphic that you know, any citizen would be proud of uh, if they're from the city. In our own work, we've been, maybe, we've been really uh, trying to somehow learn from how to make relaxed architecture. Uh, this was a museum proposal that we made recently. But you might be asking, if I'm interested in characters and personality, why wouldn't I just directly talk about the duck uh, of Venturi Scott Brown? Uh, I, I would say the reason why I don't think about the duck as often is because if I like to read a novel, or if I enjoy watching a movie, I, want, I don't want the takeaway to be a giveaway. I enjoy a sense of mystery. I enjoy a sense of suspense, maybe, a, a, a kind of idea of tension. A kind of suspense that if I were to see sketches of John Haydeck, for example, I, I would think maybe I'm seeing clues, clues that are suggestive of, you know, let's say crowns, or tentacles, or legs, but not really. And, Maybe the answer is in the beholder, never in the author. And I find that to be a beautiful relationship between the author and, and the audience. And so, which is why I don't, want, I don't want to do, I guess, literal things. I want to do something that's suggestive. Much the same way that maybe you're seeing something, maybe you're not. And, you know, then this condition that we have in, in terms of seeing uh, objects and assigning personality. I mean, really, these are just piles of rocks, right? These are piles of rocks, and, and yet we're able to maybe assign gender and, and persona onto the piles of rocks. And it's because for as long as we've been humans, we have this ability called pareidolia, uh, where we're able to decipher um, intention from our peers, 
within split seconds. We need to know the difference between friends or foe in order to survive. We're, we're not apex predators, not, ju not just because we're smart. It's because we know how to cooperate and we know how to identify friendly versus enemy. And therefore, it's real important for us to have this ability to see, I guess, very elemental composition and read faces or even bodies. And so if I were to say the composition of faces and bodies are components on a grid, the component on these kinds of, uh, I guess, faces, I, I was, yeah, well, um, you know, the eyes and the nose and the mouth are permanently attached onto the, onto the face of Emma Watson, uh, but it's by the simple twitching of muscles, uh, the audience are able to tell a wide variety of differences of emotions, and that's an ability that we have. We're expert readers of form in that way. So to say that this has something to do with architecture, I would say absolutely, in elevation, maybe, and maybe in massing. So in the way that we've been also developing our work, this is a project that we did, uh, I guess, three years ago, where we're thinking about aggregating or mashing together a bunch of personalities to create a single architecture, um, uh, like so. In that once we, I guess, smash several characters together, can we uh, discover some interesting ways of drawing the uh, surface, condition, surface conditions by the Boolean uh, union operation? Or could the bo Boolean difference operation, uh, the operation on the interior create interesting sections or plans? So these were some questions we were asking a few, two or three years ago, uh, maybe also making a difference between uh, bundle versus uh, platter versus, uh, I guess, um, a, a single single profile, but uh, I'm happy to report we no longer do this kind of work. Okay, so bricks and balloons. I'm trying to power through this as quickly as possible because, because there's a lot of slides and I want to get through them. Uh, so thank you for your patience. So as I mentioned before earlier, I published this book, Citizens of No Plays, uh, which, you know, if you went through it, it's a lot of comic books. But you might be asking, why cartoon and architecture? Is there a relationship? In some ways, I've always seen the um, cave paintings uh, as cartoons. Uh, they are as good uh, sort of caricatures of what's out there. If, if I were to uh, imagine these walls as being the Neolithic Gazette, uh, this is the perfect, um, you know, political comic section where, you know, what's out there is being documented, right? To the best degree of, po uh, to, to the best degree of accuracy possible, uh, our, ancestors, our ancestors were making these drawings. But naturally, no, no matter how you try, you lose information. Uh, there's certain textures and surfaces and, and uh, details that are not being captured by drawing. And in other words, a process of abstraction has begun uh, by the sim simple commitments of errors. Strangely, uh, the, the visual communication of text and image composition really has been with us for as long as we can remember. Uh, and what's also kind of interesting is that they've consistently resided onto the elevations of architecture. And in the case of the, uh, in the, the, these two doors in Florence by the, uh, the younger Pisano and Ghiberti, uh, we, I would even say what's contained inside of these thought bubbles are almost a cartoon page that are, I guess, welded onto architecture and to the doors. And these, uh, what's inside the bubbles are maybe, uh, you know, heroic st stories about Hercules and, so, and, and others uh, or saints of the times. Uh, but th these are, I guess, literal stories that you tell on the wall. But certain walls tell not so literal stories yet stories nonetheless. In Borromini's uh, treatment of the dome, here an implicit story is being told where the story is, is now in the hands of the subjects who occupy the architecture. And the dome or the texture and the graphics of the dome provide the backdrop to the players who are playing their parts and as a story unfold inside of this architecture. Abstract storytelling in terms of the cave paintings onto walls or floors uh, is something that's you know, really within our tradition uh, deal in terms of dealing with interior architecture. 
And uh, for me, in thinking about Keith Haring or Jean Dubuffet, sometimes the caves are being drawn by the, by the lines of the, of the architect. So with this tradition in mind, uh, recently I completed this project called Beachside Lonely Hearts uh, in Los Angeles at a, uh, at a private gallery uh, in, in Chinatown. Um, at, at the, the name of this gallery is called Jai and Jai Gallery. Um, I wanted to do a big cave painting, a really big cave painting that you know wraps around the floor to the elevation to reflect, reflect, reflect the ceiling plan, maybe in my own way participate, participating in the single surface project um, so that the delineation between you know surfaces are once again erased or diminished. It also afforded really interesting opportunities to think about the function of corners, um, uh, or how geometry is projected on the corners. Uh, here in a circle, which becomes a, a projected oval, uh, that once folded over is almost a blackened heart. Um, maybe, maybe, of course, I was thinking about the, the way that Kazimir Malevich destroyed the corner, but maybe in, there are some ways that we could make the corner do work for the graphic. This endeavor of drawing cave paintings, uh, I think, you know, was, was, was an effort that I, I really took on in 2015. So in these drawings, uh, I wanted to do a kind of homework assignment. Uh, this was in the Art Institute of Chicago. This, this one's called Cave Painting Number 8. Uh, for me, it was really important in this drawing series uh, to make sure that none of the lines that I'm putting down are mine. I want to make sure that I'm doing some kind of, let's say, homework for the, the Contemporary Architecture Gazette. So instead of horses, I'm really looking at, you know, Bernard Schumi or John Herrick or, or Daniel Liebeskind. And if you were to say, say, this composition strikingly resembles Micromegas, and you would be right, because that was the underlay. Or if you were to say, this is, is, is somehow related to the um, Moriyama house, you would also be right, because the composition of these drawings were really based on other drawings, and all, all of the lines were borrowed from people like Isamu Noguchi or Ante Liu, among others. So by embodying these kinds of homework assignments and, and really uh, learning about what constitutes a nice curve, maybe, uh, it was, uh, and I guess maybe our answer to what makes a nice curve is, was eventually redundancy. If there's a lot of it, and if there's a lot of it that we visually accept, it's probably right. And so we, you know, this was maybe that kind of homework assignment. And the output of this homework assignment kind of in influenced the way that we design even. We stopped maybe thinking about cartoon as linear narratives. In other words, no longer are we treating cartoon as a representation of architecture. Cartoon is no longer cartoons about architecture, but rather now let's think about cartoon-ish architecture architecture with cartoonish sensibilities. And our, our cartoonishness becomes a way of designing interiors, designing plans, and even designing, I guess, program. Uh, thinking about maybe the comic relief moments of swir swirling around a serpentine path and the surprises that you may encounter uh, inside of this interior. This was our Guggenheim Helsinki comp uh, competition entry, which we lost, like everybody else. <clears throat> so finally, in the last segment, I would quickly talk about normal. Like I've said, like I've said many times before, I draw comics uh, and I do architecture. And of course, in the beginning, I had influences. Uh, you know, in, I, I was a big fan of manga and anime. And you might be, one might be wondering, uh, what, what are, well, at least I was wondering, is there a relationship between uh, architects of certain regions uh, to the cartoon that's indigenous to that region. So for example, are there Japanese architects doing Japanese architecture that, are, that possess comparable qualities or intentions that we, we, will, we would find in manga? Uh, conversely, if we were to be thinking about, let's say, another really strong culture of comics in Northern Europe, in the Franco-Belgic world, uh, in the works such as Tintin, is there, are there also uh, you know, components or, or qualities about it that we can find in, you know, Franco-Belgic, even Dutch architects. Uh, the, the professionalization of manga is really incredible. Uh, manga artists are required to produce something like 
15 to 30 pages per week. Uh, and these kinds of weekly publications also demanded a very professionalized way of storytelling. In other words, you would probably expect the first two pages to be establishing shots. Uh, the climax would probably come at 75% uh, of, 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 the, of the stack. And it's, it's then also up to the author to give um, the audience a cliffhanger or a resolution. And so um, the, the impeccable qualities of the, the, these kinds of professionalized work also um, introduced a conundrum, which is uh, what are, how do you deal with imperfection in, in manga? And so we know that the sphere is not perfect, right? No, it's not perfect. But in Japan, there's even, I guess, a, a way of talking about a, a very perfect way and a very precise way of talking about imprecision. Uh, and, you know, so concepts such as wabi-sabi or mono no aware are ways of, of dealing with imperfection where one would say we accept the sadness or we accept the imperfection. So we would find that maybe in these kinds of potteries where the imperfection are even celebrated as being with high value. So when I look at the work of people like Toyo Ito or Junya Ishigami, I do find these kinds of maybe uh, pathos of the of this uh, kind of sadness of the object as they scatter around the room uh, with seemingly perfect worlds of imperfections. Uh, we, we see that maybe even within the narratives of what's behind the project, such as the U House by Toyo Ito. Um, but when we think about the, the Franco-Belgic world of comics, uh, in fact, uh, in French, pardon my French, which is non-existent, Bande Dessine, Bande dessinée is the way that they talk about this type of comic strips. Uh, it really translates to, I guess, a band of drawings. And so it has a very close, close relationship to cinematic uh, film, films, like a kind of filmic uh, frame by frame uh, type of shot relationship. And so the, as, as opposed to the manga, which is designed by the composition of the page, the frame is more important than the page in, in these cases. Uh, not only that, the punchlines have to be shorter. Uh, as I mentioned, the professionalization of manga required the story to be told uh, between many, many pages, whereas the band should tell a story. Uh, and, and so the punchlines need to be compact and quick. And so for, for, I guess for me, I've been always thinking that there, there has to be a relationship between the way that we think of Bande de Sene to Bernard Schumi's graphic portion of the Manhattan transcripts where I think he was clearly looking at Sergei Eisenstein's montage studies, uh, that the frame-by-frame -frame relationship uh, tells us how stories could be told. And maybe the band itself is, is even on the facade. Maybe this is a film strip. Maybe the ribbon window is a film strip that frames the private lives of the individuals on the inside of this architecture. And maybe sometimes we can even think of the film strip as being in plan. Uh, where the the, the the box by box to box relationship are drastic but sequential, uh, as as you would do a cut, uh, a jump cut. So as we arrive in Los Angeles and be, uh, and think about maybe the local storytelling folklore uh, traditions, uh, I can't help but think about you know Quentin Tarantino. He's not a comic book artist, but he in a way might as well be the way that he pays attention to the, to, to the good, great mixture of a cavalier attitude towards violence uh, by introducing, uh, I guess, you know, a kind of furniture texture that, that would be nonchalant to a high, high tension moment between uh, two characters. So we were thinking, how do we survive in the world of Los Angeles and how do we, how do we start, you know, developing a practice in Los Angeles? And again, um, the word was redundancy. How do we do normal things? You know, how do we stop being weird? How can Bureau Spectacular just, you know, like buckle down and do some work that is, you know, not strange? And so we decided that, okay, let's go and really and study local architecture. And so we really went and photographed local architecture as many as we can and, and identify, you know, maybe tropes or qualities or typologies and so forth. And eventually we found five interesting patterns and we, we designed five houses along these patterns. So for example, if you don't know, uh, which I didn't know, uh, there's a typology in Los Angeles called dingbat, uh, which you know, elevates a box. Um, you 
put, you could put your cars underneath it, which to an unsuspecting architecture enthusiast, I would show up thinking that uh, Los Angeles is full of Villa Savoie's. Uh, and in fact, when I think about Villa Savoie and uh, compare it to Dingbat, it's strikingly similar, which to me, then I started applying the five points of architecture onto Dingbat's. Is it, does it have a free facade, kind of? Uh, does it have, you know, pilotis, for sure? Uh, are there, you know, roof garden? Is there a roof garden? Well, if you count the kind of air ducts as, in, as being a sculpture garden, kind of. <laughs> so for, for me, I guess we wanted to maybe uh, then think about the, uh, the nonlinear storytelling tradition of Quentin Tarantino and explode the film strip and distribute it onto the facade and maybe in this way frame the program on the interior uh, separately and, dis and, and dis discreetly. The second of the five houses we were thinking, we were looking at this obsessive qual uh, life, lifestyle pursuit of, of being healthy. Not just being healthy, but looking like you're trying to be healthy. This is really prevalent in Los Angeles, uh, at least to an outsider's uh, observation. Uh, not, not just the way that they, they live or drink their juice, uh, they even want their architecture to be literally green, like actually literally with vegetation on it. So this kind of vertical landscape, uh, you know, for us afforded, afforded an, an opportunity to be thinking about uh, landscapes that are vertical that, that can be composed, maybe not in a dissimilar way that we can think of Mike Kelly's stuffed animals being composed as a landscape. Uh, and, you know, that green is a new beginning or alternate reality. Um, I'm going to skip this one. Skip. Uh, and go to the last of the five houses, the pool house. Um, you know, for, for those of us who are interested in uh, digital technology, uh, of course we want to find a way to implement doubly curved surfaces into the world. These doubly curved surfaces or saddle surfaces, we, we would think that, um, well, it's probably really hard. But we fail to remember that they're really everywhere in Los Angeles, uh, and maybe in the rest of the United States even. They're everywhere. Uh, and the tradition of dry pools uh, in Docktown maybe re was the first, one of the first moments that revealed that even helped us invent a new sport. And so the doubly curved surf surfaces in the backyard also tells us another story about the status of pools. Of course, there's the life of being in the pool, but then it's equally as important to be around the pool as well as being inside of dry pool. So taking these qualities of the pool, we decided to compose a, a house with many pools where the roof pool uh, dips down so the sagging belly compresses the section and produces, you know, maybe not in a dissimilar way that I was talking about the Farnsworth house before, uh, makes program by pinching uh, the, this, this, this particular moment. And then we can even think about the conversation pit as a dry pool or um, a reverse pool as being a hill that you can occupy. Uh, and as I was saying, being inside the pool, being around the pool, uh, being romantic uh, in, in the pool or next to the pool, the pool is a space of imagination. It's a, the pool is a space of romance, and it's, it's with, within our culture uh, to really explore. And I'm also happy to report that uh, this, this, there is somebody interested, and we might build this uh, in, in years to come. So maybe in a few years, we'll, we'll, see, we'll see this again in, in real life. But uh, that's really at, at the last end of it. I want to end by saying, you know, we, why do we want to, be, want to be normal? It's not because we're trying to be normal, but in, uh, in the words of one of my favorite bands, uh, The Antwoord, uh, the, the frontman Ninja says stuff with tattoo, uh, this phrase on himself, and he says, pretty on the skin, ugly from within. And that's precisely what we want to do. Thank you. Um, does anyone have questions? I have a mic I'm going to hand around so that you can be loud. Um. All right, I guess, I guess as the host, I have to be the first, the first questioner. Um, so I, I think the sort of idea that you end with, the, the notion of being normal, um, I, I, I guess I'm, I'm really curious why you're even exploring that, given the nature of the work that you've done in the past. Why, why try to bring it into a, a normal kind of context in, in any sense? Um, I mean, I, I guess, um, well, 
to begin with, I, I, I started thinking about what it means to be normal a, a little more seriously uh, recently, uh, in that normal is relative, right? Normal is not, rel not only relative to, lo to location, but also relative to time. And if I'm imagining what's normal, you know, in the 1980s, it's probably not very normal right now, where maybe it's slightly normal, but if we dial it back another 40 years um, to the 1940s, I mean, when Captain America steps out of his ice cube, uh, nothing seems normal to, to that person anymore. And so I think, to, I mean, this maybe element of time travel is uh, maybe interesting to me in that, you know, I want to understand what's normal around my context now in order to, to enrich my palate. So if I, was, if I were to be thinking that cartoon is, is a way of doing journalism because caricatures uh, in the polit political section is based on reality or based on, you know, what's normal out there. And if we have a deep understanding of norm, normal, uh, we can then speak the normal with hyperbole. But without knowing normal, uh, we would be, yeah, not very good at what we do, I think. So it's, it's a recent discovery, and we're, we're trying to become better architects. Um, who has a question? If you're afraid of the mic, you don't have to use the mic. Very quiet. Ah, there we go. Hi. Hi. Um, I actually don't know much of what Taliesin West is up to these days, but my my impression of both both of the Taliesins previously is that they were quite quite conservative in their outlook. And actually, I don't know much about you either, other than what you just did. Um, I'm really conservative. Well, that's kind of what I was going to ask. Uh, but from what you just presented, I never would have thought you'd want to study at Taliesin West. So, you know, what kind of drove you to go to a place that uh, doesn't seem like hyper explorative that right. is the kind of place where I would think you'd want to go? Yeah, no, I mean, okay, so um, this is maybe stemmed out of ignorance on my part. Uh, I read Frank Lloyd's book, uh, A Testament which was published in the 1930s, and it looked great. <laughs> and, and I guess uh, the fellows who showed up to Taliesin also read the same book, <laughs> and I, I just arrived too late. Uh, so when I showed up, I, I was actually really ignorant of what, what was happening then, and it was, I mean, because, you know, I, I, I grew up in Canada, and, you know, in Toronto, in a very liberal place, it was actually also the first time I met conservative people, actually. <laughs> so I really had no idea. Uh, but it was, it's a good, good learning experience because, you know, um, I, I think there's uh, things to learn from everything. And, and even, you know, conservative graphic or conserv conservative approach to architecture, there's something important to learn from as well, I think. else? All right, I think winding down. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you.